Reading now an article from the San Jose Mercury News of Wednesday, March 19th, 1986. It's an L.A. Times story headlined, Ex-Vatican Financier Convicted in Murder. Guy has sub- subheaded, God's banker is sentenced to life for ordering Milan lawyers slain. It <coughs> reads, Dateline Rome, by the way, it reads, Michele Sindona, the former Italian financier who was once known as God's banker because of his close relations with the Vatican, was convicted Tuesday of, or- was convicted Tuesday of ordering the murder of a Milan lawyer and sentenced to life imprisonment. A Milan court found Sindona, 65, and Robert Venetucci, 63, of Eastport, New York, guilty of taking part in the murder of Giorgio Ambrosoli, a court-appointed lawyer who was liquidating Sindona's crumbling bank empire. Ambrosoli was shot outside his Milan home in 1979. A hitman identified as William Arico of Valley Stream, New York, was accused of doing the actual shooting for a $50,000 fee paid by Sindona, according to court testimony. Venetucci acted as a go-between testimony indicated. Arico, a convicted bank robber, died while trying to escape from a federal prison in New York in 1984. Uh, by the way, to interrupt, he died about after jumping supposedly nine floors to escape from the prison. <coughs> Sindona already was serving a 25-year federal sentence in the United States for fraud in the biggest bank failure in American history, that of the Franklin National Bank of New York. He had gained control of Franklin National and diverted its assets in a complex swindle that led to the bank's collapse in 1974. He tried to escape the U.S. sentence by staging a fake kidnapping, allegedly with help from organized crime figures, and even endured a deliberate gunshot wound in the leg to make the phony abduction look real. A federal court in New York sentenced him to 25 years in the bank fraud. Under a new U.S.-Italy extradition treaty, Sindona was returned to Italy in 1984 and tried first for fraud in the collapse of his Italian Banca Privata Italiana, for which he was sentenced to 15 years in jail, and then for planning the Ambrosoli murder. Under the treaty, Sindona may be returned to a U.S. federal prison to serve out the remainder of his sentence in the Franklin National case, if the United States requests it, or begin serving his two sentences in Italy. In prosecution testimony at the Milan murder trial, Sindona was said to have been attempting to revive his fortunes in Italian business in the late 1970s, and feared that Ambrosoli, with his liquidator's expertise, would expose his manipulations in the Banca Privata Italiana case. The flamboyant financier once was close to the Vatican's Institute for Religious Works, also known as the Vatican Bank, and became known as God's Banker because of his dealings on the Vatican's behalf. The connection put him in close contact with his successor as God's Banker, Roberto Calvi, of the now-defunct Banco Ambrosiano. And uh, two days after that, from an article from the San Jose Mercury for March 21st, 1986, again, rather recent history here, the headline is, Sindona Falls into Coma. Poisoning suspected. Dateline Vigera, Italy, an AP Wire story. Imprisoned financier Michele Sindona fell into a deep coma Thursday, two days after being sentenced to a life term for ordering a murder, a doctor said. An Italian prosecutor and one doctor were quoted as saying poisoning was suspected because Sindona became ill while eating breakfast in Vigera prison, but the hypothesis has not been confirmed. However, Agence France Press reported that doctors said examination of his gastric juices, blood, and urine showed the presence of, quote, toxic substances. They did not identify the substance, but unconfirmed reports said it was cyanide-based. Dr. Francesco Nicrosini, director of Oguera Hospital, told the Associated Press the 65-year-old patient already was in a coma when he was brought to the private hospital from the maximum security prison. Dr. Luigi Pagliari briefing reporters in the evening on the patient's condition, said an electroencephalogram, which monitors brain waves, was flat, indicating no brain wave activity. A prison chaplain gave Sindona the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church, right after he collapsed, the Italian news agency ANSA said. The trial indictment charged Sindona with paying $50,000 to a Long Island, New York man to kill Giorgio Ambrosoli, the account examiner of the financier's collapsed banking group. Sindona was extradited to Italy in September 1984 from the United States, where he was serving a 25-year prison term for fraud in the Franklin National Bank scandal, the biggest American bank failure. Quote, his condition is very serious, Pagliari said, adding that the only improvement was a resumption of kidney function. A late afternoon bulletin had said Sindona's kidneys had failed. Acting state prosecutor Francesco De Socio, who was investigating Sindona's case, told journalists, quote, we immediately made a hypothesis of poisoning, inasmuch as Sindona felt ill while eating, and the only substance that could provoke such symptoms so rapidly and immediately is potassium cyanide. When reporters later asked Pagliari about the possibility of cyanide poisoning, he replied only, quote, I am not authorized 
to speak about cyanide. So two days after his conviction in the Ambrosola case, Sindona falls into a coma. Reading now two days later, this from the San Francisco Sunday Examiner and Chronicle of Sunday, March 23rd, 1986. A UPI story dateline of Aguera, Italy headline, Cyanide Kills Italian Bank Fraud Figure. Michele Sindona, mastermind of the biggest bank failure in U.S. history and the man who shook the Vatican's financial empire, died yesterday three days after swallowing cyanide in his prison cell. Officials said it was still not clear whether Sindona killed himself or was murdered. Military police armed with submachine guns and wearing bulletproof vests were stationed outside the morgue where Sindona's body was held awaiting an autopsy. Sindona, 65, died from cardiac arrest in mid-afternoon, hospital officials said. The medical certificate listed the cause of death as cardiocirculatory arrest consequent to anoxia, total deprivation of oxygen from poisoning, unquote. The 65-year-old Sindona had been kept alive by life support system since Thursday when he was rushed to the hospital from his prison cell in what doctors called an irreversible coma, unquote. The gray-haired financial wizard once called the most successful Italian since Mussolini, unquote, swallowed the cyanide Thursday while drinking a cup of coffee. The poisoning occurred despite the fact that Sindona was under 24-hour guard at Voghera, a prison for women 35 miles south of Milan. He was the only male inmate. Note this last sentence. His meals were prepared under police supervision and served in sealed containers. So uh, it, it, it would appear that perhaps the poison arrived via the pulling of some P2 strings here. Certainly would suggest that. Okay, the last of these series of small articles here is from the Sunday, March 23rd, 1986, San Jose Mercury News. Headline is, Financier at Center of Scandals Takes His Secrets to the Grave, a New York Times story. And uh, skipping down to the middle of the article, which the first part just recaps all the stuff we've already talked about, Italian politicians and journalists were virtually unanimous in believing that Sindona held information that could have proved embarrassing to many influential Italians. Sindona himself had been quoted as saying, they are afraid that I could reveal some very delicate information that they don't want divulged, unquote. It was still not known if Sindona was murdered or committed suicide. Well, at uh, the very least, again, the, the prospect of, uh, certainly Sindona was a man who was probably pretty depressed at this point, but he himself had expressed fear, as uh, we have discussed earlier, had, dis had expressed fear after his conviction that, that people would want to kill him. Also, even the smuggling of cyanide into his prison cell so that he could commit suicide would again um, probably have, uh, cons considering he was under maximum security and the only male prisoner in a female prison, um, would in, in and of itself have suggested some complicity from the outside world. So whether the intent was murder or whether there's some, I think, a, a very slight off chance that it was suicide, still, um, this was not something that Sindona kicked up on his own. There was definitely, it was an inside job, I guess is the best way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're looking at the situation right now where we have just uh, waved goodbye to Michele Sindona, although he will, of course, crop up again um, in our other broadcast, dealing with some of the earlier parts of this whole thing. Um, as we mentioned, uh, as we gave the dates, this is just March of this last year, just a couple of months ago, that Michele Sindona finally shuffled off the mortal coil. Um, we're going to take a break at this point and allow all of, uh, all of our listeners out there to reflect on the sins of Michele Sindona and the perhaps somewhat deferred and somewhat uh, uh, kinder than deserved uh, end that he found. And then we're going to be back to talk some more about this and about another man who may have been poisoned, but a man who certainly uh, was a far better man than Michele Sedona. Um, that and other things coming up in the next part of our broadcast. So don't go away. We're going to take a short break and give you a chance to stretch. This is Nip Tuck. Dave Emery and I will return in just a few moments with more of Radio Free America broadcasting from Foothill. We have returned. This is Nip Tuck in the studios with Dave Emery at KFJC. And uh, we are continuing with the Mediterranean merry-go-round. And uh, what you heard there, of course, was starting off Midnight Rider by the Allman Brothers. Great song. Dave and I were just talking, being the old uh, uh, children of the 60s that we are about the Allman Brothers. And apparently, uh, money and power were all that Michele Sedona wanted. But again, in the long run, and unfortunately, it's not always the rule, but uh, uh, those of you out there, uh, I'm sure that there aren't any one step beyond the listeners, but uh, just to sort of generally addressed out over the airwaves, those of you who... Uh, find the, uh, <laughs> the neo-fascist financial manipulator way of life uh, a kind of a romantic-looking thing, you might note how many of these people, and as we continue over the next uh, couple of weeks, 
uh, the incredible amount of these people that wind up dead um, uh, before their time, usually painfully, usually violently. Um, crime does pay, but sometimes uh, some of the dividends are a little unpleasant. Anyway, we're going to go back now, looking to some of the things that uh, that befall um, a, a, a character rather similar to Michele Sindona, and in fact, Michele Sindona's protege, uh, where Sindona was the shark, this man, Roberto Calvi, was the knight, and Roberto Calvi, of course, as we have mentioned before, the director of Banco Ambrosiano, the largest private bank in Italy, um, a, a very important cog in the Milan financial wheel, and Milan is the... Uh, uh, Milan is to Italy what New York is to the United States as far as the as far as financial dealings go, and Roberto Calvi uh, was to the Italian financial empire only slightly less than Michele Sindona was, and just as corrupt as we're going to find out about. Okay. Now again, we're going to be talking about uh, Roberto Calvi and uh, the man who. Well, we've already talked about him, and particularly in connection with the Banca Cattolica or Catolica, I guess. So anyway, whatever, however it's pronounced, and my Italian is non-existent. Uh, Calvi, not only the successor to Michele Sindona and his protege, but also, perhaps for our purposes, most importantly, a member of the aforementioned P2, well, the many times aforementioned P2 Lodge. We're going to look now at an account of uh, how Roberto Calvi. Uh, assumed the position of Va Vatican financial advisor after Michele Sindona, who, uh, as we indicated, is his protege, or was his protege, and we're also going to take a look at how Roberto Calvi's fortunes fell apart. Okay, The information about Calvi's uh, late great financial empire, such as it was, is in a book called In Banks We Trust. It's authored by Penny Lernou, L-E-R-N-O-U-X, published in hardcover by the Anchor Press, or dub of dub Anchor Press Doubleday, copyrighted 1984. And Penny Lanou writes about Calvi and his financial empire and the collapse of same in, 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 in Banks We Trust, and she writes as follows. Calvi's rise and fall was inextricably intertwined with the fortunes of Sindona. As the latter tells it, Calvi approached him around 1969 to say that he shared Sindona's right-wing politics and asked for help in building Banco Ambrosiano. By that time, Sindona had designs on Franklin National Bank. I told Calvi, you take care of Italy, we'll help you from America. You must be the bastione, the bulwark against communism, unquote. Sindona claimed he also told Calvi, quote, you are the man who must keep the relationship with Marcinkus, unquote. Described by the Italian press as having eyes of steel, Calvi was a professional banker from a banking family. His father was a Milanese bank director. Like many young Italians in the 1930s, he became a fascist militant while attending the university. After the war, he took a low-level job in the foreign department of Ambrosiano Bank. Quiet? Methodical and hardworking, he became a protege of one of the bank's leading managers, Carlo Alessandro Canesi, C-A-N-E-S-I, and rose with his patron through the hierarchy. He succeeded Canesi as president in 1974. The proverbial bank gnome, Calvi worked 12-hour days and had no outside interest save for the clandestine P-2. He refused to delegate authority and developed a reputation for being extraordinarily secretive. Unlike the polished Sindona, Calvi was never at ease in international financial circles, and spoke in convoluted, almost unintelligible phrases. It wasn't easy to talk to him, said one banker. He wouldn't make any attempt to find a common ground, unquote. Sindona had a different impression of the man that was probably nearer the truth. Though he may have appeared cold-blooded, unquote, Calvi was impressed, said Sindona, by counts and barons, the sort of society that Jelly attracted to the P2. He was no good at choosing other people, unquote, Sindona added. That observation applied as well to Calvi's relationship with Sindona. Wise bankers distanced themselves from the Ambrosiano Bank after learning that as early as 1973, Calvi had been using Ambrosiano funds to, to backstop Sindona's dubious operations. When Ambrosoli, the murdered state liquidator of the Sindona Empire, charged that Calvi had received a $5.6 million payment for payoff for collaborating in one of Sindona's fraudulent schemes, it became apparent, said one banker, that Sindona and his crowd had long had their hooks in Calvi. Calvi took the money and after that he could be manipulated, blackmailed, unquote. As Sindona's man at Ambrosiano, Calvi quickly learned to ape his patron. He was determined to transform his bank from a relatively small regional bank with strong religious overtones. Ambrosiano was known as the priest's bank, and at one time would-be shareholders had to present baptismal certificates to prove their Catholicism into a major international financial institution. Provided with Sindona's introductions to international bankers, Calvi created Italy's largest financial group with huge banking, financial, and insurance in interests throughout the world. Just as a Liechtenstein holding company had been the linchpin for the Sindona Empire, 
Ambrosiano's global interests were controlled through a bank holding company in Luxembourg, a haven beyond the reach of Italian banking authorities. Parts of the Ambrosiano Empire, such as its Nassau Bank, were built on the ruins of Sindona's network, but the key connection was Marcinkus, whom Sindona introduced to Calvi in 1971. Marcinkus denied that he had ever had more than cursory dealings with either man, although the Vatican Bank acquired 1.6% of Ambrosiano's parent bank in Milan, and possibly more if, as the Financial Times speculated, it held any of the, it held any of the anonymous equity in the Luxembourg Holding Company, 32% of the company's bearer shares were owned by unknown investors. And the Archbishop became involved with Ambrosiano in other ways. In 1971, a few months after Sindona and Calvi set up Banco Ambrosiano overseas in the Bahamas, a Mr. Paul Marchinkus was listed as one of its directors. In return for Marchinkus' patronage, the Vatican Bank received 8% of the Nassau Bank stock and 4% of the Luxembourg Holding Company. Sindona and other Italian financial sources noted that the Vatican Bank was able to perform valuable services for Ambrosiano and other Italian banks, as, for example, moving funds out of the country, an operation forbidden to Italian banks. Sindona asserted that in return for such favors, Calvi's banks paid the Vatican an interest rate on its deposits that was one percentage point higher than other customers received. Vatican officials denied that the bank helped to export Italian funds. So again, Calvi moves into the, basically into Sindona's vacated position as Vatican financial advisor. Note also, uh, incidentally, that uh, he was a, a fascist during World War II, as, uh, li- like Licio Gelli and others. Now, <clears throat> unlike uh, Sindona, uh, Calvi uh, himself was not as big of an international player. Uh, b- however, he, by, the, by the end of his tenure at the uh, Banco Ambrosiano, he became uh, quite an international player, as we will see. And, of course, part of the reason is that, uh, that it did not look like it at the time was because a lot of his dealings were through organizations that weren't even remotely related to standard financial uh, operations in the same way that... Uh, that uh, Michele Sindona's operations of the mafia and heroin and things like that were not part of the standard financial uh, wheelings and dealings. But now, one of the reasons that Calvi is, is so important, and we're going to be continuing on within Banks We Trust in just a moment here, is uh, not only, of course, his connection to Paul Marchinkus, but that it was the fact that um, uh, his connections to Marchinkus, when, as we will see, um, the uh, Banco Ambrosiano fell, it fell almost in conjunction with the toppling of the P2 Masonic Lodge, and all of this occurred right around the time uh, leading up to the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II. So, Sindona's decline and fall had actually occurred in the late 1970s, but what we're seeing Calvi set up for is going to be basically the final, the final crack, the straw that breaks the back of the Vatican's uh, dealings with these international financiers, or at least as far as, uh, as the case that we're studying goes. And it's Calvi's affiliation with Marchinkus that is going to be a large portion of what gets him into trouble and what also uh, leads the um, Italian investigators directly into the halls of the Vatican. So Calvi and his involvement is very, very important. Okay, continuing on with In Banks We Trust by Penny Lernou. The Italian Central Bank began pressing Calvi to clean up Ambrosiano's financial mess in Latin America when a 1978 audit revealed huge gaps in the bank's overseas accounts. But the secretive and evasive banker, using political influence and bribes, managed to put off the reckoning until May of 1982. Later investigations by the Italian banking authorities showed that some $1.4 billion had been drained through Ambrosiano's Luxembourg holding companies to its branches in Nassau, Managua, and Lima. These banks, in turn, loaned the money to Vatican-controlled shell companies in Panama. Again, for those of you who are not familiar, a shell company is actually a non-existent or barely existent company, usually a telex um, you know, and a, and a, a bank uh, deposit uh, box somewhere um, that is used as a fake company to move money in and out of and give the appearance of actual transactions. Okay? Um, so these banks, in turn, loaned the money to Vatican-controlled shell companies in Panama. Approximately $400 million was used by Calvi to buy shares in the Milanese parent bank in a bid to pay, take personal control of Ambrosiano. Another $400 million consisted of interest on that debt, which Calvi had borrowed on the euro currency market before 1978. Because no interest was paid, it was simply tacked onto the $400 million owed which meant that by 1981, the original debt had roughly doubled. Apparently, Calvi intended to offset the debt with shares from Ambrosiano. Instead, interest rates rose 
and the dollar increased in value, thus adding to the Panamanian company's indebtedness, while the Italian lira fell, diminishing the value of the Ambrosiano stock pledged as collateral. A further $400 million went for a host of P2 activities in Latin America, from, from arms purchases to under-the-table payments to right-wing newspapers. Let me just make that point again. This is a very important thing, and as Dave mentioned, now, uh, Roberto Calvi did have a history of being a uh, uh, you know, pre-war fascist in Italy. Um, uh, Liceo Gelli, of course, in his context, the P2 was an overtly fascist organization. Now, we don't want to lose track in the middle of all these banks and swindles going on that the fact that a large portion of this money and influence that was being accrued by people like Michele Sindona, Roberto Calvi, the P2, and Liceo Gelli were being used for explicitly fascist activities and that this money that was being channeled with the Vatican Bank's help Okay, which could never have happened without the Vatican Bank, was being channeled into these shell companies in Panama. And a lot of this money was ultimately making its way, as they mentioned, into arms purchases for right-wing governments and right-wing um, uh, revolutionary movements and under-the-table payments to right-wing newspapers, which those of you who read Death in Washington will, will know are a very important part of the political agenda for coups and revolutions and suppression of popular movements in Latin America. Yeah, the, uh, the distinctions between some of the various functions of P2 are being made here uh, primarily for organizational purposes. We're going to get into P2's Latin American and international dealings at great length in, in uh, our next broadcast. Going on within banks we trust. Additional euro market borrowings by Calvi in 1981-82 increased the total debt to about $1.4 billion. In the last days before his death, Calvi tried to negotiate the sale of Ambrosiano's stock at values well above the market price apparently the reason for his trip to London. But if there was any deal in the works, Calvi died before it could be completed. The Vatican Bank was involved four ways in Calvi's venture. First, Marchinkus was a member of the board of directors of the Nassau subsidiary. Second, the Vatican Bank had borrowed $250 million from Ambrosiano's Lima subsidiary, Banco Ambrosiano Andino. Third, in September 1981, the Vatican Bank gave Calvi letters of patronage comfort letters in bank parlance, for the Panama Panamanian company's debt. Calvi needed the letters to appease the directors of Ambrosiano's bank in Lima, who were insisting that he produce written proof of his assertion that the Vatican owned the Panamanian companies. This is all very important, so let me just read this last part here, because this is a major part of the exposure of the links between the Vatican Bank and the P2. Okay. Third, in September 1981, the Vatican Bank gave Calvi, and the Vatican Bank is Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, don't forget that, okay? He is the Vatican Bank. As he mentioned himself, he is the sole operator of the Institute for Religious Works. The Vatican Bank gave Calvi letters of patronage, comfort letters in bank parlance, for the Panamanian company's debt. Calvi needed the letters to appease the directors of Ambrosiano's bank in Lima, who were insisting that he produce written proof of his assertion that the Vatican owned the Panamanian companies. Again, remember, these are dummy companies. They don't exist. The Vatican Bank obliged with letters stating that it directly or indirectly controlled the companies that had received the loans and that the bank was fully aware of their borrowing activities. Again, dummy companies. Giorgio Nassano, chairman of the Lima Bank, said the letters were accompanied by signed loan account statements acknowledging interest details and repayment dates on the loans themselves. Such letters of patronage have been widely used in the international banking community as a guarantee securing the borrower's obligation to repay. No bank had ever failed to honor repayments covered by such letters until the Vatican announced in 1982 that it had no obligation to pay the Panamanian company's debt because at the time he received the letters of patronage, Calvi had given Marchinkus a secret letter releasing the Vatican Bank from any financial responsibility for the loans. Naturally, none of the directors of the Lima Bank saw the secret letters, which came to light only after Calvi's death, when Italian banking authorities were pounding on Marchinkus' door. Um, parenthetically, I would have to uh, wonder, um, as a, somebody who's been following this stuff for years, whether these letters, in fact, even existed until after Calvi's death. And maybe it was the getting of these letters that were part of the uh, unfortunate decline, uh, rapid decline, of Roberto Calvi. To Italian officials, the affair smacked of fraud. Quote, the Vatican must have known that the two sets of letters could not be genuine at the same time, argued a senior financial official. There is also a question of timing. According to the Financial Times, some of the Ambrosiano loans were made to the Panamanian companies only after receipt of the comfort letters from the Vatican. 
but Vatican officials claimed that the Ambrosiano loans involved, quote, prior financial dealings with which the Vatican Bank is not connected, unquote. On the other hand, Calvi, on the other hand, quote, Calvi had been saying for years that he was working for the Vatican, said an Ambrosiano source. We still don't know that he was lying, unquote. One result of the argument over who was responsible is that bankers have ceased to use letters of patronage. The Fourth Vatican tie was the most damaging because it proved conclusively that the bank had owned the Panamanian companies that were used by Calvi to buy Ambrosiano stock and to finance the P2. After the Calvi scandal broke, Pope John Paul appointed a blue ribbon investigative commission. Now this is John Paul II. Hmm. Pope John Paul appointed a blue ribbon investigative commission composed of Joseph Brennan, an American Catholic and former chairman of the Emigrant Savings Bank in New York, Felipe de Vec, a former president of Switzerland's Union Bank, and Carlo Ceruti, a high-ranking Italian civil servant with strong ties to the Vatican. We're going to take a look, as we did last week, uh, <laughs> at a German named Hermann Abs. Who he is and what his connection with this is, we'll talk about in a little later. And Felipe de Vec, we're going to talk about at a later point also. Among their fine, anyway, so these three people, uh, Joseph Brennan, Carlo Ceruti, and Felipe de Vec, um, are become the, uh, the oversight, the investigative commission, appointed by John Paul II. Among their findings was the fact that the Vatican Bank owned 10 of the Panamanian shell companies. According to the commission's report, the Vatican Bank had been, quote, exploited by Calvi, who had made the bank the owner of the companies without its knowledge. But the report also acknowledged that Marchinkus had learned of Calvi's manipulations in July 1981, and yet two months later he had given the banker the Vatican's letters of patronage. In fact, Marchinkus may have known of, and been a party to, such manipulations long before that. The Sunday Times of London turned up a document dated November 1974 and signed by Vatican bank officials instructing a Swiss bank to arrange the formation of a Panamanian company called United Trading Corporation. Some $226 million of the missing $1.4 billion owed by Calvi passed through Ambrosiano's Latin American subsidiaries to United Trading and since United Trading was one of the companies named in the letters of patronage issued by the Vatican Bank, the Sunday Times, and that's the Sunday Times of London, believed it, quote, could have been used to help the Vatican's financial problems, unquote. The newspaper also reported that the Vatican Bank used another Panamanian shell company, Laramie, in a secret transaction with Ambrosiano. The same paper said it had evidence that the Vatican Bank put an inflated price of $20 million on shares it owned in a Rome construction company that it sold to Ambrosiano through Laramie. But the Vatican Bank, quote, never delivered the shares and kept both the $20 million and the shares, unquote. Again, it's hard to realize, um, again, this is a parenthetical insert, it's hard to realize we're talking about the Vatican Bank. We're talking about the world's largest religious organization who not only are they making you know, shell uh, loans to shell companies and stuff, but then they're actually ripping people off. Uh, according to the Sunday Times, for the money and the shares, and things like this. Denials by the Vatican Bank that it received money from Banco Ambrosiano or Calvi, quote, must be suspect, the newspaper concluded. Calvi's wife, Clara, agreed. She said that during his trial for illegal currency dealings, her husband had summoned her and their daughter, Anna, to visit him in prison. Clara recalled that, quote, he gave us some papers on which he had written, this trial is about IOR, that's of course the Vatican Bank, he told us that we should go to Marchinkas and Menini, Luigi Menini, we talked about him earlier, the bank's managing director, and ask them for the secrecy to be removed so it would be known that he had not done it. As the two women left the prison, there was an astonishing incident. They were climbing into a waiting car when Menini's son Alex, who was an official at the Banco Ambrosiano, jumped in as well. Quote, when he saw the papers in my daughter's hand, he tried to grab them, said Clara but I sat on them and wouldn't let go. Clara claimed that Alex Menini said, quote, you must not mention this name even in confession, unquote. But if some people were worried by what Calvi might reveal, Marchinkus himself showed little apparent concern. Calvi's son, Carlo, repeatedly telephoned Marchinkus at the Vatican in an attempt to enlist his support. Eventually, the archbishop responded, quote, tell your father don't bring up our problems with the bank because they are his problems, unquote. Despite evidence to the contrary, the Vatican's report concluded that the Vatican Bank had no obligation for the $1.4 billion debt incurred by the companies. The problem with the investigative commission's report 
said the Wall Street Journal. By the way, again, that investigative commission made up, among others, of Felipe de Vec and later on Herman Obbs. The problem with the investigative commission's report, said the Wall Street Journal, was that it raised more questions than it answered. One that any banker would have asked is why Marchinkus agreed to go on playing Calvi's game by issuing the letters of patronage, particularly after Calvi had been convicted of illegally exporting $26.4 million. Another is why, why Marchinkus did not inquire into the business of the Panamanian companies once he had learned that the Vatican Bank owned them. Or, as suggested by the Sunday Times, perhaps he did know. Yet another is why the Archbishop told the Italian press in October 1982 more than a year after learning that the Vatican Bank owned the Panamanian companies, that he had no knowledge of and, quote, nothing to do with their operations. As noted by Peter Hebblethwaite, a prominent writer on Vatican affairs, Marchinkus seemed to be afflicted with, quote, extraordinary blindness, unquote. So again, note uh, an almost, well, I wouldn't say almost, I would say a numbing pattern of... Uh of malfeasance and obvious collusion with the Vatican Bank with all sorts of elements, uh, not just in, in, in sort of ad hoc criminal schemes of its own, but with the Mafia and a lot of other interests. And obviously, uh, Sid, Roberto Calvi had learned his business at, as Vatican financial advisor very, very well. And obviously, Vatican Incorporated, <coughs> excuse me, proceeded apace and did, uh, scarcely missed a beat here, despite the fact that uh, the Il Crack Sindona and the Franklin National Failure had uh, deposited one financial advisor on the other side of the law, officially, and eventually, of course, on the other side of uh, the grave. But uh, notice business as usual with Vatican Incorporated, and, and, and a fairly rotten business that was. Now, just like Giorgio Amprosoli, the uh, court-appointed liquidator of the Sindona Empire, who was machine-gunned by Arico, the uh, one of the bank investigators looking into Calvi's situation met a similar end. Returning now to In God's Name by David Yallop. Referring to here to the Superfin Company, and one of a number of different companies set up by Calvi to, for these, these uh, and Sindona for these very complicated uh, machinations. Despite the fraudulent letter from Marchinkus and his Vatican bank colleagues concerning the ownership of Superfin, despite the lies and evasions of Roberto Calvi, despite the help of his protector, Licio Gelli, the central bank inspectors concluded a very lengthy report that a great deal was rotten in the state of Calvi's empire. From South America and using his own special code name, Jelly telephoned Calvi at his private residence. For Cal Calvi, wallowing ever deeper in a mire of Mafia Vatican P2 dealings, the news was bad. Within days of Inspector Giulio Padellino handing in his report to Mario Sarcinelli, head of vigilance of the Bank of Italy, a copy of the full report was in Jelly's hands in Buenos Aires, courtesy of the P2 network. Jelly advised Calvi that the report was about to be sent from the Bank of Italy to the Milan magistrates, and specifically to a man Jelly feared would receive it, Judge Emilio Alessandrini, A-L-E-S-S-A-N-D-R-I-N-I. -S -S -I. Again, Calvi was teetering on the edge of exposure and total ruin. Emilio Alessandrini could not be bought. Highly talented and courageous, he represented for Calvi, Marchinkus, Jelly, and also Sindona, a very serious threat. If he pursued this investigation with his customary vigor, then Calvi was certainly finished. Marchinkus would be exposed, Jelly would have lost the crucial assets that the continuing thefts from Ambrosiano brought him, and Sindona would be confronted with the most powerful argument yet for his immediate extradition from the United States. By early January of 1979, the financial circles of Milan were yet again buzzing with rumors about the knight, Roberto Calvi. Judge Emilio Alessandrini, having carefully studied a summary of the 500-page report compiled by the Bank of Italy, ordered Lieutenant Colonel Cresta, the commander of the Milan tax police, to send his men into the priest's bank, unquote. His men were to check point by point the many criminal irregularities that were detailed in the report. No one outside official circles had access to the report, no one, that is, except Calvi and Jelly. On January 21st, Espresso commented on the rumors that were flying around the city, including the rumor that Calvi and his entire board of directors were about to be arrested and that Calvi's passport would be withdrawn. Something had to be done quickly before the general public created a run on Banco Ambrosiano. On the morning of January 29th, Alessandrini kissed his wife goodbye, then drove his young son to school. Having dropped off the boy, he began to drive to his office. A few seconds before 8.30 a.m., he stopped for a red light on Via Muratori. He was still gazing at the red light when five men approached his car and began firing bullets into his body. Later in the day, a group of left-wing terrorists called Prima Linea claimed responsibility for the murder. The group also left a leaflet about the murder in a telephone booth in Milan Central Station. Neither the phone call nor the leaflet gave any clear reason for the murder.
Why would an extreme left-wing group cold-bloodedly murder a judge who was nationally known for his investigations into right-wing terrorism? Well, uh, I'm going to interrupt here, by the way. Uh, just why that might happen, we're going to explain in our next broadcast, because uh, as we're going to see with regard to Italy in general, and P2 in particular, as we've seen with uh, Turple and Wilson and a lot of other things, and by the way, some of those names are going to be coming back in, too, as we go around on the merry-go-round. The distinction between right and left-wing terrorism is blurred at best in Italy. Continuing now, or actually repeating that last sentence. Why would an extreme left-wing group cold-bloodedly murder a judge who was nationally known for his investigations into right-wing terrorism? Emilio Alessandrini was one of the leading investigators into the Piazza Fontana bombing, a right-wing atrocity. Why would Prima Linnea murder a man who was clearly attempting through legal and proper channels what the terrorists would in theory most applaud, to bring right-wing criminal elements to task for their acts? Well, again, as to why the, the Prima Linnea might have done that, we're going to look at in the next broadcast. Suffice it to say that the Piazza Fontana massacre that Alessandrini was investigating was P2 linked, as we're going to look at next week. And, of course, the uh, timing of the murder of Judge Alessandrini couldn't have been more propitious from the standpoint of Roberto Calvi, Sindona, Jelly, and so forth. Yes, and we will, as we will cover uh, in later broadcasts and talk about, um, uh, and I don't know so much about Prima Linea, which are a small left-wing group, but the Red Brigade, certainly the best-known left-wing Italian terrorist group, are uh, not only prominently linked to Licio Jelly, um, uh, who actually claims to have founded them, and there is some reason to believe that he may be right. Uh, but they also um, are linked to the Neapolitan uh, underworld gang called the Camorra, which are going to play a very important role um, uh, later on in this in this uh, whole series, especially concerning Mehmet Ali Aja, a man whose name uh, we will all get sick of hearing by the end of this broadcast. Um, all right, skipping along and uh, reading from a book called St. Peter's Banker by Luigi DeFonzo, and his name, last name is spelled capital D-I, capital F-O-N-Z-O, and this book was published by Franklin Watts and copyright 1983. And he, this is just a little timeline that he's putting together on the whole thing. On July 21st, 1981, Roberto Calvi was convicted of illegally exporting currency out of Italy. He was fined $13.7 million and sentenced to four years. On July 9, 1981, like Sindona, Calvi attempted suicide but survived. Later, the Bank of Italy uncovered $1.4 billion in loans made by Banco Ambrosiano and authorized by Archbishop Paul Marcinkus, president of the Vatican Bank, Banco Ambrosiano's fourth largest stockholder, to a group of Panamanian companies believed to be controlled by Licio Gelli, Michele Sindona, Roberto Calvi, and the Vatican. Okay, again, bear in mind, just cutting into uh, DeFonzo's narrative here, again, bear in mind, we talk about those are shell companies, they're dummy companies, they're companies that are being used to channel money, among other things, directly, some of it directly back into the, into the pockets of the people concerned, but also to direct money into right-wing political activities in Latin America. Unable to block the inquiry, Calvi disappeared on June 10, 1982. Five days later, his secretary jumped to her death from a fourth-floor window of Banco Ambrosiano's Milan headquarters. That phrase probably should have been allegedly jumped to her death. Yes, allegedly jumped. She certainly went to her death. From a fourth-floor window of Banco Ambrosiano's Milan headquarters, she left behind a note proclaiming that Calvi should, quote, be twice cursed for the damage he caused to the bank and all its employees, unquote. In London, three days later, on June 18th, Roberto Calvi's body was found hanging from the Blackfriars Bridge over the Thames River. In his suit pockets, police found $20,000 in foreign currencies, a fraudulent passport, and 12 pounds of bricks and stones. So again, um, notice that uh, Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, again, not, uh, not um, without some merit, uh, referring back to the 1929 Lateran Treaty, Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, who is apparently, according to all sources, including the Sunday Times, uh, is in this up to his his uh, uh, shell-like ears, um, is sitting pretty still in the Vatican Bank, denying everything. The Vatican, uh, John Paul II in particular, has brought in a uh, an investigative commission uh, made up of people like Felipe de Vec, who we're going to talk about, with pretty doubtful political background, uh, Vatican uh, Vatican loyalists, and later on Hermann Obbs, the Nazi's biggest banker, they have given the Vatican a clean bill of health, a rather suspect uh, diagnosis. 
And uh, meanwhile, people like Sindona and Calvi are dying, um, although, of course, at this point, Sindona hadn't died yet, um, and, uh, and nobody is able to touch Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. And we might add that as of this point, as of today, Archbishop Paul Marchinkus is still in charge and is still sitting pretty in the Vatican. And is still managed to avoid arrest. He, he's hiding inside the Vatican, as we're going to uh, take a look. He, it's generally conceded uh, that if he were to step outside of Vatican City, he would be arrested forthwith. And that's purely, again, back to the 1929 Lateran Treaty, uh, negotiated by, among others, Eugenio Pacelli and his brother with the fascist government of Italy that made the Vatican exempt from normal Italian laws by making essentially a city-state of its own. Many aspects of the Lateran Treaty were recently repealed, oh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, however, much of it is still, the elements of it are still in effect. Now, again, notice what happens. Roberto Calvi's secretary goes out a window. Roberto winds up hanging, uh, quote-unquote, a suicide, quote-unquote, although actually the verdict uh, remains uncertain. It's not known whether he committed suicide. It has never been ruled whether he committed suicide or was murdered. Uh, you can make up your own mind. Nip and I have certainly made up ours, as did uh, David Yallop and an awful lot of people who have uh, watched the corpses begin to pile up as the uh, bank, uh, the Vatican Bank investigations proceed. Another name, uh, very, very briefly, uh, that uh, we should mention here, we're going to be talking about this attempted killing in connection with the Banco Ambrosiano, is a man named Roberto Rassone. He was the, uh, Rossoni, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, R-O-S-O-N-E. He was the vice president of Banco Ambrosiano who survived an assassination attempt. We're going to talk about the guys involved in his assassination attempt, two men named Abruciati and Giotolevi, in connection with uh, an arms and drug smuggling ring, also P2 linked, also linked to the shooting of the Pope, and that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Again, you can begin to see, uh, those of you who may be new to our broadcasts, why, we're, why we refer to this whole tangle as the Mediterranean merry-go-round. Before Dave re reads the next article, I was going to mention that uh, uh, one group of people who are perhaps the most convinced that Roberto's Cal Roberto Calvi's death was not a suicide but a murder are his family, and they have been among the people who have provided the best evidence to investigators to suggest that it was not. But in fact, this, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, within the last year, they got the case temporarily opened again, and then it was quickly quashed and put back on the burner again. I, th I think the, the official verdict was that it could not be determined whether right. he committed suicide. They, they, they did a fluid autopsy, and then basically they said, well, we don't know. So, uh, again, the, uh, apparently the verdict is as up in the air as Calvi was when he was hanging <laughs> from uh, Blackfriars Bridge. At any rate, we're now going to take a look at the possible, and we feel certain murder of, uh, a, in our opinion, and uh, evaluating David Yallop's evidence, of Pope John Paul I, the former Albino Luciani, because this pope was uh, going to attempt to do what uh, judges Alessandrini and Ambrosoli were, were going to do, what uh, the murdered police chiefs Verisco and Giuliani were, Giuliano were attempting to do, which is to bring the whole Vatican Mafia P2 axis under control. And we use the term axis advisedly here in light of the links going back to the rat line and so forth. Now, Albino Luciani, when he was uh, the Cardinal of Venice, had come across the, the evil machinations, is the only way to put it, by the Vatican Bank and Messrs. Sindona and Calvi when the aforementioned Banca Cattolica di Veneto, which, with which Luciani had a great deal of, uh, well, basically he, he had an account in it, and that bank was very much connected with his diocese and uh, with some pet projects that Luciani had going. Basically, uh, this bank was very callously appropriated and uh, in, in a very suspicious and uh, possibly illegal manner by, well, definitely illegal manner, uh, uh, by the Vatican Bank. And uh, the, the point of this being that Albino Luciani, when he was Cardinal of Venice, basically ran across, in a, he ran afoul of the whole Marchinka sindona calvi axis early on. This, among other things, prompted an investigation by Luciani.